can do with simplexes after all just a set of points so we can intersect it. Well, guess what? That is the convex hull of the intersection of the generating um, sets of points. What it says is the following. It says, if two simplices meet, they do so along a mutual face. When two simplices meet, they do so along a mutual face. Right. And of course the face has to be in the simplicial concept complex because, you know, um, all faces of a given simplicial complex are in the simple com simplicial complex as well. We define the dimension of K to be the maximum dimension among, among all the simplices it contains. All right. So intuitively, a simplicial complex is a set comprising a bunch of simplices that are glued together along their faces. I like that sentence. It's a, it's a, it's a great sentence. Are we good so far? So like you could think of a simplicial complex corresponding to this triangle. It would be a lot of things, right? It would be the whole thing together, P, right? And union with edge one, union with edge two, union with edge three, union with vertice one, union with vertice two, union with vertice three. You can check it out. That set of um, simplices satisfies these two conditions. All right, like it would include all of the faces of the polytope as well as the condition that if you look at when any two edges meet, where do they meet? Well, they meet at a vertex, which is again a face, right? And like similarly, this one, if you take here the simplicial complex, well, it would be the union of all four faces, all four vertices, um, all one, two, three, four, five, six edges, right? And the tetrahedron itself, the polytope, generated by all, all four points. All of that together is a simplicial complex, which is in some sense describing this tetrahedron. All right? And again, if you take two, any two of those simplices inside and you take their intersection, they meet along an edge, or two edges meet at a vertex, which is again a face. So this is just system, systematizing the nature of what a polytope looks like in its relation to edges, vertices, and faces. All right. What is an oriented simplex? It's an or oriented simplex definition. An oriented simplex What's that? Well, that is sigma bar, I guess. P0, P1, da 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 da, Pn. Sorry, I got the way here. This. Yeah, now we use the vector bracket. So that's. So, okay. Well, I wasn't too far off. I guess. If you just want to orient my earlier, if you want to orient the earlier part of the lecture, it's fine. But so this is, is you know, this is, is the convex hull of these guys, right, as, a, as an independent set of points, right? Supposing that, of course, those are independent. Um, I guess you could extend the meaning of this past the point they're independent. But anyway, let, let me focus here. Um, so it's this, it's this simplex, this oriented simplex is simply a simplex where you are keeping track of the order of the generating vertices, if you like. So keeping, order. keeping track of the order. And um, so in which we've chosen an order for all points up to an even permutation, that is all simplices are divided into precisely two equivalence classes or orientations. 
I think depending on when one whether chooses an odd permutation or an even permutation of the vertices, p0 through pn. Um, so let me just, I, I might have to erase my examples, it's sad, but because I probably want to refer to them in like about three minutes, but it's okay. You know what a triangle is. You know what a tetrahedron is. So let's talk about this oriented simplex business a little bit more. So um, what example was I on? Example six, seven, I can't remember. Maybe six. So we could talk about P0, P1. This would be oriented one simplex. It's an oriented one simplex. And if I was to say look at P1, P0, that would be the oppositely, oppositely oriented. And so kind of like we do in Calc 3, what we're going to do is we're going to say that P1, P0 is minus p0, p1. Maybe we haven't done it yet, but we'll soon be doing that, okay? And if I had like a two simplex, the way this works is I could have like p0, p1, p2, right? And that would be like um, p minus p0, p2, p1 which would, by the way, be equal to P2, P, um, my bad, I'll get it eventually here, um, P2, P0, P1, which would be minus P2, P1, P0. So, um, I mean, there's six different permutations, I suppose, like we can do, let me think about it, zero, one, two, um, <coughs> one, two, zero, what am I missing, zero, one, two, one, two, zero, two, zero, one, I got that one. I've got two, one, zero. I've got zero, two, one. See here, I'm thinking. Let's see, there's one other possibility. Let me just let me just write them down, so I can figure it out. Zero, one, two, one, one, two, zero, two, zero, one, versus two, one, zero, one, zero, two, zero, two, one. Which one am I missing? Zero, zero, one, two. I think I got that one. To start with, yeah. Um, one, zero. one, zero, two. And how do I get f from, let's see here, one, zero, two. So I flip these last two, so that's P1, P0, P2. So, um, So the, the um, well, I, you know, I'm not sure I'm supposed to be writing quality right here right now. <laughs> Give me a second. <laughs> am, I getting, am I getting us into trouble? Uh, um,
Well, here's what he says. He says the ordered collections 0, 1, 2, 1, 2, 0, 2, 1, 2, 0, 1 represent the same oriented 2 simplex, whereas the other represent the, the other oriented 2 simplex. Two oriented simplices have opposite orientations. We can, we can represent them. Oh, okay, so yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I guess what we're, we're, about to, what we're about to admit is that we're not really working with, in some sense, what we're about to work with is not really oriented simplices. It's actually equivalence classes up to orientation of simplices. And so like all, um, if, I, if I draw a picture, So P0, P1, P2, P0, P1, P2, then um, let's see here, this one, and on the other hand, that one. So this is the 0, 1, 2 simplex, whereas this is the um, 2, 1, 0 simplex, if you like. I mean, you could use any of like this one, or this one, or that one. They're all ways of describing this oriented 2 simplex. All right, and um, so if we, if you think about right-hand rule, it may be helpful. So like in some sense, it's orienting the normal this way, whereas this one is putting the normal into the board. You can kind of think of it that way. It's not that, but what I'm trying to say is it's capturing that. It's capturing that because the right hand rule has nothing to do with what I'm formally defining here, but what I'm formally defining here captures the same idea as the right hand rule with regard to these two dimensional triangles, right? Your question? Mm -hmm. So these ones are equivalent, not equal. Technically. They're equal. They're equal. Yeah, I think he says equal. Uh, that's a good question. Are they equivalent or equal? I, I don't know. Let, let's let's put a let us. Fair enough, Ernesto. Let us add some appropriate question marks about whether equality should be written here or just equivalence. Okay? I'm not sure. Although he does say explicitly that these all of the ones that are underlined in pink, those represent the same oriented simplex. He says that these are all the same oriented simplex. So I'm really thinking equality is probably okay here. All right, <clears throat> moving on. If I can find my eraser. definition. Let K be an oriented simplicial complex. So what's that? <laughs> That's just a simplicial complex where every simplex is oriented. All right? Great. An M chain on K with coefficients in the reals is a formal linear 
combination, formal linear combination of the oriented m simplices in K with coefficients in R. My apology to those watching along. <laughs> there we go. Don't worry, you didn't miss anything yet. And um, so specifically, uh, oriented uh, an M chain has the form C, C for chain, C bar equal to the sum over I of A sub I sigma bar um, sub I. A sub i real. Subject to the convention that if sigma bar i and sigma bar j represent or oppositely oriented simplices, sigma bar i equal to minus sigma bar j. So my example 7 is correct. We do intend those minuses. That's the definition which is being made right now. Those minuses exist in the set of formal linear combinations which we had yet to define. So my apologies, but yeah. Now, um, the vector space of all such M chains in K is denoted, um, so this is an element of what we denote by CM K. So this is, this is a vector space of all M chains in K. So here's a fun thing to think about. Why is it a vector space? Right? In particular, what does it even mean? Formal linear combination what is that? A formal linear combination of simplices. Do you get what we're talking about? <laughs> what even is this thing? What's the dimension of this vector space? So for the tetrahedron that I had written, since there were six edges, um, Maybe C sub 1 of the K corresponding to the tetrahedron would be a six-dimensional vector space, whereas C sub 2, because there were four faces to the tetrahedron, C sub 2 would be a four-dimensional vector space. And its basis is the faces. So, yeah. Why is the vector space closed under like addition? Think about this. If you have the face in the simplex, um, then of course we can disorient the face, and that gives us minus minus the minus the oriented simplex rather. And so they add to zero. So the fact that we you know allow the the orientation provides the negatives <laughs> of every um, every particular simplex in K. But anyway, where are you? Let me go on. Now, check this out. Let sigma bar equal to the oriented simplex generated by P0, P1, da da da. Uh, Pn. So this is an oriented, an oriented n simplex. All right. Behold, the boundary operator on sigma bar is defined to be the sum j equals zero to n of minus one to the power j. 
and then we take the oriented simplex P0, dot, 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 Pj minus 1, Pj plus 1, dot, 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 Pn. In other words, delete the jth one from the list, right? So this boundary operator is natural. So this, this, this defines how the boundary operator acts on a, um, on a simplex, right? So then there is a unique linear extension of the boundary operator to M chains because every M chain is a linear combination of M simplexes. So if I define it on the set of M simplexes, which form a basis for the space, I can extend it linearly. And so this linearly extends to a mapping from M chains to what? What, what are you doing? You're taking uh, N simplex and you're doing what? You're getting rid of one. So um, that would be an N minus one simplex. It's very hard for me to stop lecture today. I just want to go on, but I must go. I must stop at some point here because otherwise I will be totally worthless for complex. So, um, so then what? What do you? What do you think is going to happen here? Example eight. Let's actually put this into practice for a specific example, right? So, like. So this was like P0, P1, P2, right? And let's calculate what's the boundary of, you know, like P0, P1, P2, how's that work? Let's follow the definition. So we start out with, we delete the zeroth one, right? So to start out with, we get P1, P2. And then we do plus, minus 1 to the 1, and we delete 1, P0, P2. And then we do minus 1 to the 2 power, and we delete the second one, so that gives you P0, P1. Let me rewrite it again down here nice and clean. So we've got P1, P2, minus P0, P2, plus P0, P1. What's going on here? What's the significance of the minus? Can you see it? So one to two, like this, right? Zero to one, like this. <laughs> what about zero to two? Like that. See that? So if I use the orientation math, you know, then I have this guy it goes the way it's supposed to. See it? So the boundary operator. It algebraically creates, this is so cool, the right, the positively oriented edge of the, of the triangle. I just, I, 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 I love this stuff. It's like so cool, so cool. Um, but there's more. What happens if you take the boundary of the boundary? First of all, me calling this the boundary operator is a reasonable thing, isn't it? Because like the this thing, right? It's the whole thing, and then we calculate a partial. We just get the edge. That's the boundary, topological boundary. 
oh, we'll get the vertices, but what happens when we calculate partial squared? See then, by definition, we linearly extend. So this is what the linear extension looks like. So we do partial on this one, plus the partial on this one, plus the partial on that one, right? And how does the boundary operator act on that? How does it work? You delete the first one and leave the second one, right? You, then you do minus one. Don't, don't be, a, don't be a, a slave to the enumeration here, right? Like, you've got to think through it. We do delete the, sec, delete the first one, leave the second one. Then we do minus delete the second one, leave the first one, right? Next one, plus P2, minus P0. It's the other way around. Plus P0, minus P0. I'll get it eventually. I, uh, so, like, delete the first one, leave the second one, minus... Um, delete the uh, second one, leave the first one, and then this one, delete the first one, leave the second one, and delete the uh, second one, leave the first one. What happens? See that? We get zero. That is not an accident. We can prove, and that's what I'll probably start next class with, that partial squared is equal to zero on, you know, all of the space of M chains. And here I mean M to be a variable whatever that thing should be called, the space of all, the formal linear combination of all possible M chains over the oriented simplex. Then, that's where the abstract algebra really picks off because then you can talk about different chains. Um, one chain is the boundary of another and we can talk about, anyway, so this, what we're studying the abstract algebra of the boundary operator leads us to the construction of what's called homology. And homology, ultimately is a way of detecting the abstract space of, extra, abstract set of, uh, the abstract um, nature of space in terms of holes and so forth. Um, but the, the, so the neat thing about this is, it, we need to talk about this in here because essentially building some, oh you're fine, building some kind of contraption like this is really the dark heart of what is driving the generalized Stokes theorem. Something like this, some kind of theory of boundary. Um, and this is a really beautiful theory of boundary. And actually, Rentland has a proof of the generalized Stokes theorem basically for an oriented simplex in a future section, which we'll try to go through. And, um, but the other interesting aspect is this is a lecture that I give also in my abstract algebra two class, because it is I mean, you don't really need, if you think about this, do we need any of like the exterior calculus, any of really the harder, no, it's just algebra. And the interesting aspect of it really is going to be more or less linear algebra. So we'll, we'll, we'll actually calculate the homology of like a sphere next class most likely, some things like that. Yep, yep.